Part Two, Chapter One of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1794. Arrival in America. It is probably very presumptuous on my part to continue to write these memoirs at the age of nearly seventy-three years. But having to-day finished the task of copying the part which I had already written upon loose sheets, I warn you, my dear son Aymar, that you shall have the rest, if God permits, as long as I retain a little strength and reason and eyes to guide my hand. An enterprise of this kind demands above all things memory, and it seems to me that I have not entirely lost mine. But abandoning preambles, let us return to our entrance into the port of Boston. Our ecstasy, I admit with shame, was entirely concentrated upon an enormous fresh fish which the pilot had just caught, and which, with a pitcher of milk, fresh butter and white bread, composed what the captain called a welcome breakfast. While we were eating with voracious appetites, we were advancing towed by a boat up this magnificent bay. At two cables length from the land, our captain dropped the anchor and then left us with the promise to return in the evening after having found us a lodging. We did not have a single letter of introduction, and we awaited his return with patience. Fresh provisions arrived from all sides. Several Frenchmen also came who were impatient to have news. They assailed us with questions to which we could reply only very imperfectly. One wished to know what was going on at Lille, another at Grenoble, a third at Metz. And all were surprised and almost angry to obtain replies only regarding Paris or France in general. Most of them were very common people, ruined merchants or workmen who were looking for positions. They left us in a very bad humour, and we were not troubled by them during the rest of the time that we were at Boston. The remainder of the day was passed in putting our things in order. The captain returned in the evening. He had found a little lodging upon the marketplace and his ship-owner had charged him to offer us his services. My husband resolved to go to see him the following day on landing. The captain told us that he was a rich man and highly considered, and that we were fortunate to be under his protection. You may well believe that daybreak the following morning found me already awake. I made my adieu to all the members of the crew individually by shaking hands with them. These worthy fellows have been full of attention for us. The cabin boy shed tears on separating from my son. Everyone expressed his regret at parting, and I, for my part, was very sorry not to be able to take the dog Black, who was much attached to me. I had consulted my friend Boyd to learn whether the captain would willingly let me have her, for it assured me that the request would be refused, and I therefore did not dare to make it. Our good captain conducted us first to one of the best inns, where he had ordered prepared an excellent luncheon, and we found everything of which we had been deprived for so long a time. After this we went to the little lodging-house chosen by the captain, where my husband left me to go and see the owner of our ship. Mr. Geyer was one of the richest proprietors of the city of Boston. Although he had returned after the peace to enjoy his fortune in his native land, he had been counted among the partisans of England, and had taken no part in the revolution against the mother country. Following the example of many other Boston merchants, he had even taken his family with him to England during the war. My husband was received by Mr. Guy with a charming cordiality. I omitted to say that at Poyac we were moored alongside a vessel which was waiting for a favourable wind like ourselves, and which was bound for England. 
i had written a few words in haste to madame denin then living at london to beg her to write us at boston in care of mr guyer whose address had been given me by the captain the length of our voyage had permitted my aunt to reply and we found on landing letters which settled the place in the united states which we were to inhabit i will return to this later the house in which were located the rooms found for us by the captain was inhabited by three generations of ladies mrs pierce her mother and her daughter the house was situated upon the market-place the locality the most frequented and most animated in the city our lodging comprised on one side a little sitting-room lighted by two windows looking out on the market-place on the other side at the top of a little stairway a comfortable bedchamber allotted to my husband and my children and myself this room had a view over an isolated dockyard where ship carpenters were working beyond that extended the neighbouring country you will see later why i enter into these details we arranged for board with some excellent people who nourished us well in the english fashion the evening of the first day found us settled as if no grief or inquietude had ever troubled our life toward the middle of the night i was awakened by the barking of a dog and by a scratching at the door of the kitchen which opened out on the dockyard this bark was not unknown to me i got up and opened the window by the moonlight i could recognize the dog black i at once descended and opened the door for her as soon as she had entered my room i saw that the poor beast was so wet that she certainly must have remained a long time in the water the following morning i found that she had been kept chained on board during the day but that at ten o'clock in the evening a sailor thinking that it would be all right to release her had done so and she had immediately jumped into the sea as the diane was at anchor about a mile from the quay it is certain that the good beast must have swum this entire distance and then have searched through the city until she discovered exactly the door of the house which was nearest to the room where we were sleeping the captain felt a sort of superstition that he must not oppose an attachment so clearly shown black never left us again and returned with us to europe the morning of the day after our arrival mr guyer came to see me with his wife and daughter he spoke french quite well but the ladies did not know a single word they were delighted to find that their language was as familiar to me as it was to themselves mr guyer offered to put at our disposal a farm which he owned about eighteen miles from boston perhaps we should have done well to accept his proposition but my husband wished to be as near as possible to canada where he would have liked to settle he spoke english with difficulty although he understood it perfectly and the thought that french was as it still is the language which is usually spoken at montreal gave him the desire to live in the vicinity of that city in the letters which we had received from england Madame de Nin, while regretting that we had not been able to rejoin her in England, sent us letters from an American who was one of her friends. This lady, Mrs. Church, recommended us to a family residing at Albany. She was the daughter of a General Schuyler, who had gained a great reputation during the War of Independence. Until a short time before the surrender of General Burgoyne at Saratoga in October 1777, he had commanded the american army which opposed the forces there from canada by general burgoyne to reinforce the english army which was in possession of new york since the peace general schuyler a hollander by origin lived upon his estate with all his family his eldest daughter had married the head of the van rensselaer family which was settled at albany and possessed a large fortune in the county mrs church 
seeing the great maternal interest and tender friendship which animated our aunt wrote to her relatives and we received on our arrival in boston very pressing letters from general schuyler in which he urged us to come without delay to albany where he assured us we would easily be able to establish ourselves to this end he offered us all of his support we therefore made up our minds to accept his proposition having sent all of our baggage by sea to new york whence it will be forwarded to albany by the hudson river we waited at boston for the news of its arrival at destination before setting out by land we preferred to make in this way the trip of two hundred miles as it would permit us to see the country and would not be more expensive before dispatching our baggage we were obliged to unpack and repack all the boxes as they contained a lot of articles which would be useless to people who like ourselves were going to live in the country under conditions similar to those of peasants in europe there was no indication that the revolution would permit us to return to europe for a long time and i was happy i admit that my husband had been received in the united states in a manner which turned him from the idea of going back to england for i had a kind of presentiment that we would not be well received by my family at boston i sold everything among the effects which we had brought with us which could bring us in a little money as the diane had made the voyage without cargo our baggage which had cost us nothing to transport was very considerable we disposed of more than half of it clothing cloth laces a piano music porcelains everything which would be superfluous in our little household was converted into money and then into drafts upon persons of responsibility at albany after remaining a month at boston we set out with our two children umbert and seraphine the first of june and fifteen days later we arrived at albany we traversed the whole state of massachusetts of which we admired the fertility and the air of prosperity but a sad piece of news that made me so melancholy that i did not enjoy anything before leaving boston my husband had heard of the death of my father who perished on the scaffold the thirteenth of april he awaited the time of our journey to tell me in the hope that the necessary distraction of travelling would be a kind of relief for me it was at northampton where we passed the night that he resolved to tell me fearing lest i should read of the sad event in some paper all the news of france was reproduced in the american papers as soon as it was received in every port of the union the death of my father strongly affected me although i had expected it for some time though i had seen very little of him for years i nevertheless had for him the most tender affection i wrote to my stepmother who was living in martinique with my sister fanny who was then twelve years of age a long time afterwards i received a reply from madame dillon in which she announced her departure for england with fanny and mademoiselle de la touche a daughter by her first marriage the letter was very cold and my stepmother did not trouble herself at all over the conditions of my existence in america in spite of everything as generally happens when you see new objects i was diverted from my grief by the beauty of the woods which we had to traverse to arrive at lebanon the last stop where we passed the night before arriving at albany a forest fifty miles wide then separated the state of massachusetts from that of new york these woods which probably are no longer in existence afforded a spectacle new to me with all the degrees of vegetation from the tree commencing to spring from the earth to that which had fallen from age the route laid out through these splendid woods was no wider than the wagon track it was a simple opening through the trees which had been cut off at the foot and thrown to the right and left to leave a passageway about midway 
we stopped for luncheon at an inn recently erected in the middle of these immense woods in america as soon as a rustic house is built in the forest if it is near a road even if only one person passes during the course of the year the first expenditure of the owner is the purchase of a sign and the first task is the erection of a post to attach it then he nails to the post below the sign a letter-box and this locality where the road is hardly laid out is at once designated upon the map of the country as a city the wooden house where we stopped had reached the second degree of civilization as it was a frame house that is to say a house provided with sashes and panes of glass at the end of the dinner which we took together the master of the house rose removed his cap and with a respectful air pronounced these words we will drink to the health of our beloved president you would not then have found a cabin no matter how buried it was in the depths of the woods where this act of love for the great washington did not terminate every meal sometimes there was also added a toast to the marquis monsieur de lafayette who had left a well-loved name in the united states at lebanon there was an establishment of sulphurous baths which was already quite important the inn was very good and above all was perfectly neat but the luxury of white bed linen was then unknown in this part of the united states a request for it would only have appeared fantastic and would not have been understood the city of albany the capital of the state had been almost entirely burned two years before by an insurrection of negroes slavery was not yet entirely abolished in the state of new york except for children to be born during the year seventeen ninety four and only when these had reached their twentieth year this very wise measure which obliged the owners of the slaves to raise them gave on the other hand to the slave the time to make good to his master by his work the cost of his education one of these quote, blacks a very worthless character who had hoped that the act of the legislature would give him his liberty without conditions resolved to be revenged he enrolled several miserable fellows like himself and on a fixed day arranged to set fire to the city which at this time was constructed mainly of wood this atrocious plan succeeded beyond their expectations fires were started in twenty places at once and houses and stores with their contents were destroyed notwithstanding all the efforts of the inhabitants at the head of whom laboured the old general schuyler and all his family a little negress twelve years old was arrested at the moment she was setting fire to a store with straw from the stable of her master she revealed the names of her accomplices the next day a court assembled upon the still smoking ruins and condemned the black chief and six of his accomplices to be hung which sentence was executed at once the van rensselaer and schuyler families set the example of great activity in repairing the disaster cargoes of merchandise of brick and of furniture were brought up from new york and a charming new city sprang from the ashes of the old houses of stone and especially of brick were erected which were covered with plates of zinc and tin and when we arrived at albany there was no longer any trace of the fire the house of general schuyler and that of his son-in-law mr van rensselaer each being isolated in the midst of a garden had been spared it was there that we received a welcome which was as flattering as it was hospitable general schuyler in seeing me said now i shall have a sixth daughter he entered into all of our plans our desires and our interests he as well as all his family spoke french perfectly when we arrived in america 
the head of the Berminsalir family, which was divided into a large number of branches, all of which were rich, was married to the eldest daughter of General Schuyler. By the people, he was called the patroon, a Holland word which means seigneur. The very day of our arrival at Albany, towards evening, we took a walk in a long and very fine street, at the extremity of which we discovered a tract of ground enclosed by a simple palisade, painted white. This was a very well-kept park, planted with fine trees and flowers, and surrounding a handsome mansion of very simple architecture, with no pretensions to art or exterior beauty. Behind were to be seen a number of outbuildings, which gave to the whole establishment the air of a very fine and well-kept farm. I asked of a young boy who opened the gate to permit us to descend to the edge of the river, who was the proprietor of this large mansion. He replied with an air of surprise that it was the house of the patroon. On my saying that I did not know what he meant by the word patroon, he was filled with astonishment. Two days later we were received in this house with a kind attention and friendship which in the future never failed us. Mrs. Van Rensselaer was a woman of thirty years who spoke French very well. She had learned the language while accompanying her father to the general headquarters of the American and French armies. She was endowed with a superior mind, and with an extraordinary clearness of judgment regarding men and things. For years she had not gone out of the house, where she was confined to her chair by the state of her health for months at a time, the beginning of a malady which led her to the tomb a few years later. By reading the papers, she had kept informed as to the state of the parties in France, the mistakes which had brought on the revolution, the vices of the higher class of society, and the folly of the medium classes. With an extraordinary perspicuity, she had penetrated the causes and effects of the troubles of our country better than we ourselves. She was very impatient to make the acquaintance of Monsieur de Talleyrand, who had arrived at Philadelphia, having been dismissed from England at very short notice. With his usual quickness of apprehension, he had made up his mind that France had not yet finished the different phases of the revolution. He brought for us important letters from Holland, which Madame Denine had confided to him. She wrote me, among other things, that Monsieur de Talleyrand had come to pass in a country of real liberty, the period of cruel folly from which France was suffering. Monsieur de Talleyrand asked where he could find me, at the end of the trip to the interior of the country which he was thinking of making, in company with Monsieur de Bometz, his friend, and a millionaire Englishman who had just arrived from India. End of part two, chapter one. Part two, chapter two of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Seventeen ninety four. The farm near Albany. As we did not wish to remain at Albany, General Schuyler took charge of finding us a farm which we could buy in the neighbourhood. He advised us in the meantime to arrange for three months to live with a family of his acquaintance, which was located not far from the farm which his brother, Colonel Schuyler, occupied with his twelve children. Her sojourn at Albany, therefore, was not prolonged beyond several days. After this, we went to live with Mr. Van Buren to learn American manners, as we had made it a condition of living with this family, that they were not to change in any way the customs of the house. It was also arranged that Mrs. Van Buren should employ me in the housework, the same as if I were one of her daughters. Monsieur de Chambeau, at the same time, began an apprenticeship with a carpenter of the little growing city of Troy, situated at a quarter of a mile from the Van Buren farm. 
he set out on monday morning and returned saturday night only to pass sunday with us we had just received news of the tragic end of my father-in-law who perished upon the scaffold the twenty eighth of april seventeen ninety four Monsieur de Chambeau had received at the same time news of the death of his own father. As I was a very good seamstress, I fashioned for myself my morning costume, and my good hostess, having thus learned to appreciate the skill of my needle, found it very pleasant to have a seamstress at her command without cost, when she would have been obliged to pay a dollar a day and board if she had hired one from Albany my husband visited several farms we were awaiting the arrival of the funds which had been sent us from holland before purchasing the farm which we expected to acquire general schuyler and mr van rensselaer advised my husband to divide his funds into three equal parts a third for the purchase a third for the management the purchase of negroes horses cows agricultural implements and household furniture and a third part added to what remained of the twelve thousand francs brought by us from bordeaux for a reserve fund to meet unexpected circumstances such as the loss of negroes or cattle and also for living expenses the first year this arrangement became our rule of conduct personally i resolved to be in a position to fulfil my duties as manager of the farm I began by accustoming myself never to remain in bed after sunrise. At three o'clock in the morning during the summer I was up and dressed. My room opened upon a little lawn stretching down to the river. When I say opened, I am not speaking of the window, but of the door which was on a level with the turf. Therefore without moving from my bed I could see the vessels passing. The Van Buren farm, an old mansion built in the style of Holland, occupied a delightful situation upon the bank of the river. Entirely isolated on the land side, it had easy facilities of communication with the other side of the river. Opposite, on a highway to Canada, was situated a large inn, where could be found all the notices, the papers and the posters regarding sales. Two or three stage coaches passed there every day. Van Buren owned two canoes, and the river was always so calm that it was possible to cross it at any moment. No road crossed this property. It was bounded at a distance of several hundred yards by a mountain covered with fine trees belonging to the Van Burens. We often said that this farm was just what we wanted but the value was far beyond what we were able to pay. This was the only thing which prevented us from acquiring it, for the general rule in America at this time was that no matter how attached a man might be to his house, his farm, his horse or his negro, if you offered him a third more than the value, you were assured of becoming the owner. During the month of September, my husband entered into negotiations with a farmer whose land was situated on the other side of the river, upon the road from Troy to Schenectady, a distance of two miles in the interior. The situation of this farm, upon a hill overlooking a large expanse of country, appeared to us agreeable. The house was new, pretty, and in very good condition. The land was only partially under cultivation. There were 150 acres sown down, as many in woods and pasturage, a small kitchen garden of a quarter of an acre full of vegetables, and finally a handsome orchard sown with red clover and planted with cider apples. These trees were ten years old and in full bearing. They asked us 12,000 francs. General Schuyler did not think the price exorbitant. The property was situated at four miles from Albany, upon a route which they were going to open up to communicate with the city of Schenectady, which was in a thriving situation. The proprietor did not wish to move until after the snow was well packed. 
as we had arranged with the van burens who evidently had had enough of us for two months only it was necessary therefore to look for another home from the first of september to the first of november at troy we found for a moderate sum a little wooden house in the midst of a large yard enclosed by a board fence here we established ourselves and as it would be necessary for us to purchase some furniture for the farm we immediately acquired what we wanted these pieces of furniture added to those which we had brought from europe permitted us to be well settled at once i had engaged a white girl who was quite satisfactory she was to be married in two months and consented to enter my service while awaiting the erection of the log house which her future husband was building where they expected to live after their marriage here is what is meant by a log house a plan better than a description would give an exact idea a piece of land fourteen or fifteen feet square was levelled and the construction was begun by building a brick chimney which was the first comfort of the house then the walls were erected these were composed of large pieces of wood covered with bark which were hewn in such a manner as to join exactly to each other above the walls was constructed the roof with an opening for the chimney in the middle a door was installed we see many of these houses in switzerland where they serve exclusively for the use of the cattle and the men who guard them in america these houses represent the first degree of shelter and often the last for there are always unfortunate persons and these log houses in a prosperous city become the refuge of the poor one day at the end of september i was in the yard with a hatchet in my hand occupied with cutting the bone of a leg of mutton which i was preparing to put on the spit for our dinner all of a sudden i heard behind me a loud voice which said in french on ne peut embrocher un guichot avec plus de majesté turning quickly i saw monsieur de talleyrand and monsieur de beaumetz having arrived the evening before at albany they had learned from general schuyler where we were they came on his part to invite us to dinner and to pass the following day with them at his house these gentlemen were to remain in the city only two days an englishman who was one of their friends was accompanying them and was very impatient to return to new york however as monsieur de talleyrand was very much amused at the sight of my leg of mutton i insisted that he should return the following day to eat it with us he consented leaving the children in the care of monsieur de chambeau and betsy we set out for albany en route we talked a great deal upon all kinds of subjects as people do when they meet after a long time the latest news from europe of which they were ignorant owing to their visit to niagara from which they had only just returned was more terrible than ever blood flowed in floods in paris madame elizabeth the sister of the king had perished our relatives and our friends were counted among the victims of the terror when we arrived at the house of the good general he was on the stoop from a distance he made signs to us and cried come quickly come quickly there is great news from france we entered the sitting-room and every one of us took a paper here we found the news of the revolution of the nine thermidor the death of robespierre and his followers the end of the shedding of blood and the just punishment of the revolutionary tribunal monsieur de talleyrand was rejoicing especially that his sister-in-law madame Marchambault de perigord had escaped when later in the evening having taken up from the table a paper which he thought he had read he found her name among the terrible list of victims executed the ninth thermidor that very morning during the session in which robespierre was denounced the news of her death painfully affected him 
his brother who cared little for his wife had left france in seventeen ninety and as their fortune belonged to his wife yet found it more convenient that she should remain in order to avoid confiscation she left three children a daughter who was later duchesse de poix and two sons louis who died in the army under napoleon and edmond who married the youngest of the daughters of the duchesse de courlande without the news of this cruel event our evening with general schuyler would have been more agreeable mr law the travelling companion of mrs de talleyrand and de Beaumetz, could have passed for the most original of englishmen all of whom are more or less so he was a tall blond man forty or forty-five years of age with a handsome sad face that evening upon returning to their inn he said suddenly to monsieur de talleyrand mon cher nous ne partirons pas après demain eh pourquoi vous avez retenu votre passage sur le sloop qui descend dans new york oh, cela est égal je ne veux pas partir ces gens de Troyes que vous avez été chercher eh bien tu veux les revoir encore plusieurs fois demain vous irez chez eux oui j'irai vous y prendre le soir je veux voir cette femme-là chez elle then he became silent and they could not get another word out of him the following morning after having dined with our paternal general monsieur de talleyrand and my husband returned to troy i had preceded them during the morning for it was necessary for me to prepare the dinner for my guests a little negro drove the carry-all which could be easily procured at albany for a dollar monsieur de talleyrand was amiable as he had always been for me without any variation with that charm of conversation which no one has ever possessed to a greater degree than himself he had known me since my childhood and therefore assumed a sort of paternal and gracious tone which was very charming i regretted sincerely to find so many reasons for not holding him in esteem but i could not avoid forgetting my disagreeable recollections when i had passed an hour in listening to him as he had no moral value himself by singular contrast he had a horror of that which was evil in others to listen to him without knowing him you would have believed that he was a worthy man that evening mr law accompanied by mr Beaumetz, came to take tea i already had a cow and gave them some excellent cream we went for a walk and mr law offered me his arm and a long conversation followed between us brother of lord landolf he had left while still very young for india where for a period of fourteen years he had been in the employ of the government of patna or some similar post there he had married a rich indian widow by whom he had two sons who were still children his wife had died leaving him a considerable fortune upon his return to england he had not been happy and had formed the resolution of coming to america to invest in that country in the purchase of land a part of the capital which he had brought back from india two days later we were to pass the day at mrs van rensselaer's with all the schuylers monsieur de talleyrand had been extremely impressed by the remarkable culture of mrs van rensselaer and could not believe that she had not passed years in europe she had a very clear understanding of american affairs and the revolution of which she had gained a profound and extended knowledge through her brother-in-law colonel hamilton who was the friend and also the most intimate confidant of washington colonel hamilton was expected at albany where he intended to pass some time with his father-in-law general schuyler he had just resigned the position of secretary of the treasury which he had held since the peace it was to him that the country owed the good order which had been established in this branch of the government of the united states monsieur de talleyrand knew him 
and had the very highest opinion of him but he found it very remarkable that a man of his value and endowed with talents so superior should leave the ministry to assume the profession of lawyer giving as his reason for this decision that the position of minister did not give him the means of bringing up his family of eight children such a pretext seemed to talleyrand very singular and so to speak even a little naif at the end of the dinner mr law took talleyrand by the arm and led him into the garden where they passed some time the departure of these gentlemen was fixed for the following day and they had formed the plan of coming to troy in the morning to say adieu to us after his conversation with talleyrand mr law stated that he had letters to write and return to his inn monsieur de talleyrand then led my husband and myself to a corner of the salon where he related what monsieur law had said in these terms my good friend i am very fond of these people and my intention is to lend them a thousand louis they have just purchased a farm it will be necessary for them to have cattle horses negroes and so on as long as they inhabit the country they will not repay my loan besides i would not accept it it is necessary for me to help them in order to be happy if they refuse i shall fall ill they will render me a real service in accepting my offer then he added cette femme si bien élevée qui fait la cuisine qui traite sa vache qui lave son linge cette idée m'est insupportable elle me tue voilà deux nuits que je n'en ai pas dormi talleyrand was a man of too good taste to turn to ridicule such a feeling he asked us very seriously what reply he should make to tell the truth we were very profoundly touched by this proposition notwithstanding the originality with which it was made we requested monsieur de talleyrand to express to his friend our very sincere thanks and to assure him that for the moment we were able to take care of all the demands of our establishment but that later on if owing to some unexpected circumstance we found ourselves in need we would promise to let him know this promise which he received that evening quieted him a little the following morning he came to say adieu the poor man was as embarrassed as if he had done something wrong we were awaiting with impatience the first snowfall and the moment when the river will be frozen for three or four months in order to have the ice solid it is necessary that the freezing should take place during twenty-four hours and that the ice should be two or three feet thick this peculiarity is due entirely to the locality and the immense forests which cover the large continent to the west and north of the settlements of the united states but it is not due to the latitude it is probable that at the present writing the great lakes are now almost entirely surrounded by settlements and that the climate of the region in which we lived has notably changed from the twenty fifth of october till the first of november the sky was covered with a mass of clouds so thick that the day was obscured a north-west wind bitterly cold blew with great violence and every one made preparations to put aside whatever could be covered up by the snow we took out of the river the boats the canoes and the barks turning upside down those which had no decks everybody at this time displayed the greatest activity then the snow commenced to fall with such abundance that you could not see a man at ten paces ordinarily the ice formed two or three days before the first care was to trace with pine branches a wide route along one of the banks in the same way were marked the places where the border was not steep and where one could pass upon the ice it would have been dangerous to pass elsewhere for in many places the ice lacked solidity 
upon the edges. We had acquired moccasins, a kind of foot covering of buffalo skin made and sold by the Indians. The price of these articles was sometimes quite high when they were embroidered with dyed bark or with porcupine quills. It was in purchasing these moccasins that I saw the Indians for the first time. They were the last survivors of the Mohawk tribe, whose territory had been purchased or taken by the Americans since the peace. The Onondagas, established near Lake Champlain, also were selling their forests and disappearing at this epoch. From time to time some of them came to us. I was a little surprised when I met for the first time a man and woman practically nude promenading tranquilly upon the highway, without anyone seeming to find this remarkable. But I soon became accustomed to this, and when I was settled on the farm I saw them almost every day during the summer. We took advantage of the first moment that the route was traced and trodden down to commence our moving. The funds which we awaited from Holland had arrived, and my grandmother, Lady Dillon, who had died the 19th of June, had left me a legacy of three hundred guineas, although she had never seen me. With this money we bought our farm utensils. We already possessed four good horses and two work sleds. A third served for our personal use and was called the Pleasure Sleigh. It could hold six persons. It was constructed in the form of a very low box. At the back was a seat a little wider than the body of the sleigh, which was placed upon a box in which we could put small packages, and it had a back higher than your head, which broke the force of the wind. The other seats, two in number, were composed of simple planks. Buffalo robes and sheepskins covered the feet. Two horses were attached and we were carried very swiftly. We accordingly set out to establish ourselves on our farm, although the sellers were still occupying it. They were in no hurry to move out, and we were literally obliged to put them out the door. At this time we bought a negro, and this purchase, which seemed to be the most simple thing in the world, produced in my case a feeling so new that I shall remember it all my life. A few days after our arrival, the people from whom we had purchased the farm finally went away, leaving us the house which was dirty and badly kept. They had abandoned the property after having occupied it for several years, because it had become too small for them, and they were going to take possession of another place on the other side of the river. As soon as we were alone in the house, we spent a little money in arranging it. The house comprised only the rooms on the ground floor, and was raised five feet above the earth. At the time it was built, they had commenced by constructing a wall buried six feet in the ground, and rising two feet above the surface. This part formed the cellar and the milk room. Above, the rest of the house was a wood as you still see frequently in Switzerland. The vacant spaces in the carpentry work were filled with sun-dried bricks, which formed a wall very compact and very warm. Monsieur de Chambeau had well profited by his four months of apprenticeship with the master carpenter, and had really become a very good workman. Besides, it would have been impossible for him to think of idleness, for my activity admitted of no excuse. My husband and he could have applied to me those words of Talleyrand on Napoleon. Celui qui donnerait un peu de paresse à cet homme serait le bienfaiteur de l'univers. In short, during all the time that I lived at the farm, well or ill, the sun never found me in my bed. End of part two, chapter two. Part two, chapter three of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
1795 A Country Life How butter did not feel the effects of the winter. My cream was always fresh. This brought me in every day quite a little money, and the sledge load of wood also sold for at least two dollars. Our slave Prime, although he did not know how to read or write, nevertheless kept his accounts with such exactitude that there was never the slightest error. He often brought back some fresh meat which he had bought at Albany, and upon his return my husband, from his report, wrote out the sum of the receipts and expenditures. Property like ours was generally burdened with a small rent, which was paid either in grain or in money. Our farm paid to the patroon Van Rensselaer twenty-two pecks of corn, either in kind or in money. All of the farms in this immense estate, which was eighteen miles wide by forty-two miles long, were held under the same conditions. One of our neighbours at Albany, Monsieur de Jardin, had brought from Europe a complete suite of furniture and, among other things, a fine library of a thousand or fifteen hundred books. He loaned these books to us, and my husband, or Monsieur de Chambeau, read to me during the evening while I worked. We took our déjeuner at eight o'clock and our dinner at one o'clock. In the evening at nine o'clock we had tea, with slices of bread, our excellent butter, and some fine Stilton cheese which Monsieur de Talleyrand sent us. With this consignment he had sent for me personally a present which gave me the greatest pleasure. This was a very fine woman's saddle, with the bridle and other accessories complete. No gift had ever come in more a propos. We had indeed bought with the farm and, quote, to boot, two handsome mares, exactly similar in coat and form, but very dissimilar in character. One had the temperament of a lamb, and although she never had a bit in her mouth, I mounted her the very day that she was saddled for the first time. In a few days, I could harness her as well as though she'd been a workhorse. Her manners were very agreeable, and when you wished, she would follow you like a dog. The other was a regular devil whom all the skill of Monsieur de Chambeau, an old cavalry officer, could not succeed in subduing. We were able to master her only in the spring, when we made her work between two strong horses. The first time she was hitched up in this way she was so furious that at the end of ten minutes she was wet with sweat. In time, however, she calmed down and made an excellent mare. She was worth at least twenty or thirty louis. Apropos of the springtime, it is interesting to recount with what promptitude it arrived in these parts. The latitude of forty-three degrees then made itself felt and resumed all its empire. The northwest wind, after having prevailed throughout the winter, ceased suddenly during the first days of March. The southerly breezes commenced to blow, and the snow melted with such speed that the roads were transformed into torrents during two days. As our dwelling occupied the slope of a hill, we were soon free from our white mantle. During the winter the snow, three or four feet deep, had protected the grass and the plants from the ice. Therefore in less than a week the fields were green and were covered with flowers, and an innumerable variety of plants of every kind unknown in Europe filled the woods. The Indians, who had not appeared during the entire winter, began to visit the farms. One of them, at the beginning of the cold weather, had asked my permission to cut some branches of a kind of willow tree which had shoots large as my thumb and five or six feet long. He promised me to weave some baskets during the winter season. I counted little upon this promise, as I did not believe that Indians would keep their word to this degree, though I had been so informed. I was mistaken. Within a week after the snow had melted, my Indian came back with a load of baskets. He gave me six of them, which were nested in one another. The first, which was round and very large, was so well made that when filled with water it retained it like an earthen vessel. 
I wished to pay him for the baskets, but he absolutely refused, and would accept only a bowl of buttermilk, of which the Indians are very fond. I was very careful not to give my visitors any rum, for which they have a great liking. But I had in an old pasteboard box some remnants, artificial flowers, feathers, pieces of ribbons of all colours, and glass beads, which were formerly much in vogue and I distributed these among the squaws, who were delighted with them. I had been suffering for a period of two months with a double intermittent fever. This attack, which lasted from five to six hours, interfered very much with my daily work. It enfeebled me and took away my appetite, and although I never lay down, it caused me to shiver even in a temperature of eighty-five degrees, and made me incapable of any work. Under these circumstances, a young girl, my neighbour, who lived not far from us in the woods with her parents, came to my aid. She was a seamstress by trade and worked perfectly. She arrived at the farm in the morning and remained all day long, and asked no wages except her meals. My son Humbert was then over five years of age, although to judge by his size, any one would have thought he was at least seven. He spoke English perfectly, much better even than he did French. A lady of Albany, a friend of the Van Rensselaers, and wife of a minister of the Church of England, had taken a great fancy to him. Several times already he had been to pass the afternoon with her. One day she proposed to me to take charge of the boy during the summer, promising me to teach him to read and write. She said that in the country I had not the time to look after him, and that he would take my fever, and added several other reasons to persuade me to yield to her wish. This lady, whose name was Mrs. Ellison, was about forty years of age, and had never had any children, which was a great grief to her. I ended by consenting to let her have Humbert, and he was very happy and very well cared for with her. This arrangement relieved me of a great deal of care. On the farm I was always afraid that he would have some accident with the horses, of which he was very fond. It was almost impossible to prevent him from accompanying the negroes to the fields, and above all from mingling with the Indians with whom he always wished to go away. I had been told that the Indians sometimes kidnapped children. Therefore when I saw them hanging for hours around my door, I imagined they were awaiting a favourable moment to take my son. A nice wagon loaded with fine vegetables often passed before our door. It belonged to the Shakers, who were located at a distance of six or seven miles. The driver of the wagon always stopped at our house, and I never failed to talk with him about their manner of life, their customs and their belief. He urged us to visit their establishment, and we decided to go there some day. It is known that this sect of the Quakers belonged to the reformed school of the original Quakers who took refuge in America with Penn. After the war of 1763, an Englishwoman set herself up for a reformer apostle. She made many proselytes in the states of Vermont and Massachusetts. Several families put their property in common and bought land in the then uninhabited parts of the country. But as the clearings approached and reached them, they sold their establishment in order to retire further into the wilderness. Those of whom I speak were then protected on all sides by a forest several miles deep. They therefore had no reason as yet to fear their neighbours. Their establishment was bounded on one side by woods which covered 20,000 acres, belonging to the city of Albany, and on the other by the river Mohawk. Without doubt, at the present writing, they no longer live in this locality where I knew them, and have retired beyond the Great Lakes. This establishment was a branch of their headquarters at Lebanon, which was located in the large forest through which we passed in going from Boston to Albany. Our Negro Prime, who knew all the routes in our neighbourhood, conducted us to their place. At the start we were at least three hours in the woods, following a road which was hardly laid out. 
then after having passed the barriers which marked the limits of the shaker property the road became more distinct and better marked but we still had to pass through a very thick forest broken here and there by fields where cows and horses were pastured at liberty finally we came out in a vast clearing traversed by a pretty stream and surrounded on all sides by woods in the midst was erected the establishment composed of a large number of nice wooden houses a church schools and a community house of brick the sheikh whose acquaintance we had made greeted us with kindness although with a certain reserve they showed prime the stable in which he could put up his horses for there was no inn we had been advised that nobody would offer us anything and that our guide would be the only one to speak to us he first led us to a superb kitchen garden perfectly cultivated everything was in a state of the greatest prosperity but without the least evidence of elegance many men and women were working at the cultivation or the weeding of the garden the sale of vegetables represented the principal source of revenue to the community we visited the schools for the boys and girls the immense community stables the dairies and the factories in which they produced the butter and cheese everywhere we remarked upon the order and the absolute silence the children boys and girls alike were clothed in a costume of the same form and the same colour the women of all ages wore the same kind of garments of grey wool well kept and very neat through the windows we could see the looms of the weavers and the pieces of cloth which they were dyeing also the workshops of the tailors and dressmakers but not a word or a song was to be heard anywhere finally a bell rang our guide told us that this announced the hour of prayer and asked if we would like to be present we consented very willingly and he led us towards the largest of the houses which no exterior sign distinguished from the others at the door i was separated from my husband and monsieur de chambeau and we were placed at opposite extremities of the immense hall on either side of a chimney in which was burning a magnificent fire it was then the beginning of spring and the cold was still felt in these large woods this hall was about one hundred and fifty or two hundred feet long by fifty feet wide it was entered by two lateral doors the building was very light and the walls without being ornamented in any way were perfectly smooth and painted a light blue at each end of the hall there was a small platform upon which was placed a wooden armchair i was seated at the corner of the chimney and my guide had enjoined silence which was all the easier for me as i was alone while keeping absolutely silent I had the opportunity to admire the floor which was constructed of pine wood without any knots and of a rare perfection and whiteness upon this fine floor were drawn in different directions lines represented by copper nails brilliantly polished the heads of which were level with the floor i endeavoured to divine what could be the use of these lines which did not seem to have any connection with each other when at the last stroke of the bell the two side doors opened and i saw enter on my side fifty or sixty young girls or women preceded by one who was older who seated herself upon one of the armchairs no child accompanied them the men were arranged in the same manner at the opposite side where were my husband and monsieur de chambeau i then observed that the women stood upon these lines of nails taking care not to cross them with their toes they remained immobile until the moment when the woman seated in the armchair gave a sort of groan or cry which was neither speech nor song all then changed their places and i imagined that this kind of stifled cry which i had heard must represent some command after several evolutions they stopped and the old woman murmured a quite long string of words in a language which was absolutely unintelligible but in which were mingled it seemed to me some english words after this 
they went out in the same order in which they had entered. Having thus visited all parts of the establishment, we took leave of our kind guide and entered our wagon to return home, very little edified regarding the hospitality of the Shakers. When the Shaker who came to sell vegetables and fruit passed before our farm, I always bought something. He was never willing to take money from my hand. If I remarked that the price which he asked was too high, he replied, just as you please. Then I placed upon the corner of the table the sum which I thought sufficient. If the price was satisfactory, he took it. If not, he climbed into his wagon without saying a word. He was a man of very respectable appearance, always perfectly dressed in a coat, vest and trousers of grey homespun cloth of their own manufacture. One thing had rendered me at once very popular with my neighbours. The day that we took possession of our farm, I adopted the costume worn by the women on the neighbouring places, that is to say, a skirt of blue and black striped wool, a little camisole of light brown cotton cloth, a handkerchief of the same colour, with my hair parted as it is worn now and caught up with a comb. In winter I wore grey or blue woollen stockings with moccasins or slippers of buffalo skin. In summer, cotton stockings and shoes. I never put on a dress or a corset except to go into the city. Among the effects which I had brought to America were two or three riding costumes. These I used to transform myself into a dame élégante when I wished to pay a visit to the Schuylers or Van Rensselaers, for very frequently we dined and afterwards passed the evening with them, particularly when it was moonlight, and above all during the period of snow. At the beginning of the summer of 1795, we received a visit from the Duc de Lyoncourt. He has spoken of this very kindly in his Voyage en Amérique. He came from the new settlements formed since the War of Independence upon the banks of the Mohawk and on the territory ceded by the Oneida nation. Monsieur de Talleyrand had given him letters of introduction to the Schuylers and Van Rensselaers. After a sojourn of a day with us, I offered to take him to Albany to present him to these two families. Had he taken seriously my woollen skirt and my cotton camisole? I do not know, but the fact is that he seemed to begin to understand that we had not entirely become beggars when he saw me appear with a pretty robe and a very well-made hat, and when my negro mink brought up a fine wagon to which were hitched two excellent horses in a harness which shone brilliantly. This was the moment for me to exclaim that for nothing in the world would I take him to see Mrs. Van Rensselaer or Mrs. Schuyler if he did not himself make a little change in his toilette. With his garments covered with mud and dust, torn in several places, he had the appearance of a shipwrecked sailor escaped from the pirates, and nobody would have thought in this bizarre get-up was concealed a first gentleman of the chamber. We arranged our conditions. I agreed to take him to see Mrs. Van Rensselaer and Mrs. Schuyler, and he consented to open his trunk, which he had left at the inn in Albany, in order to clothe himself in a more conventional manner. Then I went to pay a visit in the city while waiting for him to change his costume. After we had made our calls, he promised to return the next day to the farm, and I left Albany, taking back with me his travelling companion, Monsieur Dupetit Trois. As for Monsieur de Lyoncourt, I did not see him again. The fever with which I was suffering at the time made it impossible for me to go out. Besides, this philanthropic grand seigneur had extremely displeased me, and my friends did not like him any better. The spirituelle Mrs. Van Rensselaer had sized him up from the first as a man who was very ordinary. Perhaps I shall be reproached with ingratitude for treating him in this way, for he spoke of me in the most flattering manner in his book. 
Several days after the visit of Monsieur de Lioncourt, about the month of June, we received from Monsieur de Talleyrand a letter in which he informed us of a fact that might have caused us the most serious consequences, and at the same time spoke of the important service which he had rendered us under the circumstances. The balance of the funds which we had received from Holland, 20,000 or 25,000 francs, had been deposited with the Morris Bank at Philadelphia. Monsieur de Talleyrand had offered to withdraw this money for us, and was only awaiting the formal authorization of my husband to do so. By chance, which was really providential, he learned one night, through an indiscretion, that Mr. Morris was going to announce his failure the next day. Without losing a moment, he went to the house of the banker, forced his door, the entrance of which had been denied him, and penetrated his cabinet. He told him that he was aware of his situation, and forced him to place in his hands the Holland drafts, which had only come into his possession as a depository. Mr. Morris was constrained by fear of the dishonour which would have resulted to him from an abuse of confidence, which M. de Talleyrand would not have hesitated to proclaim. The only condition he made was that M. de la Tour du Pain should sign an acknowledgment of the payment of these funds. M. de Talleyrand therefore urged my husband to come to Philadelphia to arrange this matter. At the same time, he advised me to accompany my husband, for, having consulted several physicians, he said, regarding the persistency of my fever, all were of the opinion that only a journey would cure me of it. Mr. Law possessed a charming mansion at New York, and had already urged us several times to come and make him a visit. The haying would not begin before another month, and Monsieur de Chambeau was familiar with all the details of the farm work. There was nothing, therefore, to stand in the way of this trip. Our neighbour Susie, the young girl of whom I have already spoken, agreed to come and take my place to look after my little girl. As for my son Humbert, who was still with Mrs. Ellison at Albany, he would not even know of our absence. End of part two, chapter three. Part two, chapter four of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1795, A Visit to New York Steamboats had not yet been invented, although this kind of motor power was already in use in some factories. We even had ourselves a steam turnspit, which acted perfectly, and which we used every week in cooking either the roast beef for our Sunday dinner, or the immense brown and white turkeys, which were of a species very superior to that found in Europe. But Fulton had not yet applied this discovery to boats, and since I have touched on this subject, I will relate at once how the thought was suggested to him. Between Long Island and New York there is an arm of the sea, a mile or more wide, which small boats can cross without interruption whenever the weather permits. Since it is not a river, there is no current, and the tide is only apparent from the elevation of the water, and does not interfere with navigation. A poor sailor had lost his two legs in battle. Being still young and vigorous, he had a great deal of strength in his arms. The idea came to him to place athwart his bark canoe a round pole with wings at the two extremities at the right and left of the boat, which he was able to turn at will while seated in the stern. This ingenious system was observed by Fulton one day when he had hired the boat to go to Brooklyn on Long Island, and this gave him the first idea of applying steam to navigation. Trade with Albany, which was very considerable at this time, was carried on by large sloops and barks. Nearly all of these boats had good rooms, with a fine saloon at the stern, and carried passengers. The descent to New York took about 36 hours, as it was necessary to remain at anchor during the period of the rising tides. 
the boats always endeavoured therefore to leave albany at daybreak we accordingly went on board one of these barks in the evening and before sunrise we were already far from the point of our departure the north or hudson river is extremely beautiful the banks covered with houses or pretty little villages spread out on either side until you reach the very high and steep chain of mountains which runs the length of the continent of north america and which has various names in different localities green mountains appalachians or alleghanies the river before entering the highlands forms a large basin over a mile wide similar to that part of the lake of geneva called le fond du lac with this difference that here the mountains rise from the edge of the water the opening through which the river passes situated between two steep mountains can be seen only when you are very close to it the water is so deep that a large frigate could be moored to the side of this passage without danger of touching bottom the whole morning of the day after our embarkment we were sailing in the midst of these beautiful mountains then the tide having left us we went ashore to visit the historical place of west point celebrated for the treason of general arnold and the fate of major andre although i have visited many different places and admired not a few great effects of nature i have never seen anything comparable to the pass at west point perhaps it has now lost some of its beauty if they have cut down the fine trees which dipped their ancient branches in the waters of the river these mountain sides were useless for cultivation i therefore hope from my love of nature that the desire of making clearings has not touched them we arrived at new york on the morning of the third day and here we found monsieur de talleyrand with mr law their reception was most friendly both were alarmed at my thinness and the change in my appearance they therefore would not hear of my proposed trip to philadelphia which it was necessary to make by stage it meant that i would have to pass two nights on the way my husband undertook the journey alone and i was confided to the good care of mrs foster the housekeeper of mr law this good woman exhausted for my benefit all the prescriptions of her medical repertoire four or five times a day she came to me with a little cup of some kind of bouillon which she urged me to take i submitted willingly to this regime as i had been much disturbed by the lamentations of monsieur de talleyrand over my decline the three weeks which we passed in new york have remained in my memory as a most agreeable period my husband returned at the end of four days he had much admired the fine city of philadelphia but what i envied him most was the fact that he had seen the great washington who was my hero even today i cannot console myself at having missed seeing this great man of whom his friend mr hamilton had spoken to me so often I found again at New York the whole Hamilton family. I had been present at the time of their arrival at Albany, in a wagon driven by Mr. Hamilton himself, when he came to resume the practice of his profession as a lawyer, after having resigned the position of Secretary of the Treasury. As I have already stated, he gave up this position to have a better chance of leaving a small fortune to his children mr hamilton at that time was about thirty-eight years of age although he had never been in europe he nevertheless spoke our language like a frenchman his remarkable mind and the clearness of his thoughts mingled well with the originality of monsieur de talleyrand and the vivacity of monsieur de la tour du pin every night these distinguished men with two or three others came for tea seated upon the terrace the conversation which was started between them lasted until midnight and sometimes later at one moment mr hamilton would relate the story of the beginnings of the war of independence of which 
the dull memoirs of that imbecile Lafayette have since rendered the details so insipid. At another, Mr. Law would speak of his sojourn in India, of his administration of Patna, where he had been governor, of the elephants and the palanquins. Between them all, the conversation never languished. Mr. Law enjoyed these evenings so much that when we spoke of our departure, he became very sad and said to his butler, Foster, if they leave me, I am a dead man. Three weeks had rolled around when the news became current one evening that yellow fever had broken out in a street very near to Broadway where we were living. That very night my husband and I were very ill. I think from having eaten too many bananas or pineapples or other fruits brought from the islands by the same boat which had carried the fever. Fearing to be shut in by the quarantine, I resolved to leave at once, and at daybreak our trunk was packed, and we had gone to reserve our places on board a sloop which was ready to sail. We then returned to see Mr. Law and make our adieu. He decided then to leave also, under the pretext of going to visit some property in the new city of Washington, which they were beginning to build. In these purchases he compromised the greater part of his fortune. Our departure was so precipitate that I did not even see Monsieur de Talleyrand. He was not yet up when we were already far from New York. On our return we saw with the same admiration the fine pass at West Point, and this time we made a long promenade on land during the six hours our boat remained at anchor. We ascended the hill upon which was situated the inn which was the place of the last interview between Arnold and Andre. At New York I had seen the aged General Gates, who had known all the French officers and loved to talk of them. I had been cautioned not to speak of the incident of Major Andre, a subject of conversation which was very painful to him, not because he reproached himself with the sentence, which was pronounced in conformity with the rules of military justice, but because it recalled to him the terrible reprisals made by the English, who had executed a number of American prisoners. I found my house in the best of order, although Monsieur de Rochambeau did not expect us. My little girl was also in very good health. This absence of a month had appeared long to me in spite of the very agreeable society in which i had lived the yellow fever made great ravages that year at new york and i congratulated myself that we had left so quickly i resumed with new ardour my rural occupations my fever had departed with the change of air and my strength had returned the work of the dairy was resumed, and the pretty designs moulded upon the butterballs informed my customers of my return. Our orchard promised a magnificent harvest of apples, and our barn contained grain for the whole winter. Our negroes, stimulated by our example, worked with good spirit. They were better clothed and better nourished than those of our neighbours. I was feeling very happy under these circumstances when God struck me a most unexpected blow and, as I then imagined, the most cruel and terrible that one could endure. Alas, I have since experienced others which have surpassed it in severity. My little Seraphine was taken from us by a sudden illness very common in this part of the country a kind of infant paralysis. She died in a few hours without losing consciousness. The physician from Albany, whom Monsieur de Chambeau had gone to bring as soon as she began to suffer, gave us no hope that she would live, and declared that this malady was then very common in the country, and that no remedy was known. The young Schuyler, who only the day before had been playing with my daughter during the afternoon, succumbed to the same trouble a few hours later, and rejoined her in heaven. 
this cruel event threw us all into a state of sadness and mortal discouragement we brought umber home and i endeavoured to obtain distraction from my grief in occupying myself with his education he was then five and a half years old his intelligence was very well developed he spoke english perfectly and read it easily there was no catholic priest either in albany or in the neighbourhood my husband who did not wish to have a protestant minister called himself performed the last rites for our child and placed her in a little enclosure which had been arranged to serve as a cemetery for the inhabitants of the farm it was situated in the middle of our woods almost every day i went to kneel upon the grave the last resting place of the child whom i had so much loved it was there that god gave to me a change of heart up to this period of my life although i was far from being irreligious i had never taken much interest in religion during the course of my education no one had ever spoken to me of religion during the first years of my childhood i had had under my eyes the worst possible examples in the highest society of paris i had been witness of scandals so often repeated that they had become familiar to me to the point of no longer moving me in this way every thought of morality had been benumbed in my heart but the hour had come when i had to recognize the hand which had smitten me i do not know exactly how to describe the transformations which came over me it seemed to me as if a voice cried out to me that i must change my whole being kneeling upon the grave of my child i implored her to obtain from god who had already recalled her to him my pardon and a little relief from my distress my prayer was heard god accorded me then the grace to know and serve him he gave me the courage to bend very humbly under the stroke which had smitten me and to prepare myself to support without complaining the new griefs which in his justice he deemed it proper to try me with in the future from that day the divine will found me submissive and resigned although all joy had disappeared from our household it was none the less necessary for us to continue our work and we encouraged each other my husband and i to find distraction in the obligation under which we were not to remain a moment idle the harvest of the apples approached it promised to be very abundant for our orchard had the finest appearance we could count upon the trees as many apples as there were leaves the autumn before we had essayed what is known at bordeaux as une façon this consists in turning over with a spade a square of four or five feet around each tree something which had never been done there before the americans indeed have no idea of the effect which that produces upon vegetation but when in the springtime they saw our trees covered with blossoms they looked upon us as sorcerers another act brought us great reputation instead of buying for our cider new barrels made of very porous wood we succeeded in finding at albany several casks which had contained bordeaux and also some marked cognac which were well known to us then we arranged our cellar with the same care as if it were to contain wine of the medoc we borrowed a cider mill to crush the apples a horse twenty-three years old which general schuyler had given me was hitched to it here is the story of this horse which i have not previously recounted the horse had carried him through the war and the general wished to let him die a happy death it seemed as though he had almost reached the end of his days when our negro prime saw him in the pasture dragging one foot after the other and reduced to skin and bones prime requested me to ask the general to give me the horse 
which he did with pleasure. He had been a magnificent pure-blooded animal, but he no longer had any teeth. Prime had much difficulty in leading the poor beast the four miles which separated the pasture from our stable. Every day he gave him a mixture of oats and boiled corn, hay finely cut up, carrots and so on. This fodder in abundance restored to the fine animal the vigour of his youth. At the end of the month I could mount him every day, and soon at a little gallop he carried me even to Albany without making a false step. They refused to believe that he was the same horse. This display of skill greatly increased the reputation of Prime. But to return to our apples. The cider mill was very primitive. It consisted of two pieces of channelled wood which fitted into each other and was turned by our horse attached to a pole. The apples were fed into a hopper and when the juice had filled a large tub it was taken to the cellar and poured into the casks. The whole operation was very simple and as we had very fine weather this harvest was a charming recreation. My son, who rode the horse during the day, was convinced that without him nothing could have been done. When the work was finished, we found ourselves provided with eight or ten barrels to sell, in addition to what we had reserved for ourselves. Our reputation for honesty was so great that people had confidence that we would not put any water into our cider. This enabled us to sell it at double the ordinary price, and all was sold at once. As for that which we had reserved for ourselves, we treated it exactly as we would have done with our white wine at Le Bouil. The crop of corn followed that of the apples. This corn was very abundant, as it is the one which succeeds best in the United States, where it is indigenous. You must not leave the ear covered with the husk more than two days. We brought together all of our neighbours to finish the harvest quickly on the spot. This is what is called a husking bee. We began by sweeping the floor of the barn with as much care as though we were going to give a ball. Then, when night arrived, we lighted several candles and the people assembled, about thirty in all, black and white, and set themselves to work. One of the party did not cease to sing or to tell stories. Towards the middle of the night we served to each one a bowl of hot milk, which we had previously mixed with cider. To this mixture you add five or six pounds of brown sugar if you are prodigal, or an equal amount of molasses if you are not, then spices such as cloves, cinnamon and nutmeg. Our workers drank to our very best health the contents of an immense wash boiler filled with this mixture, with which they ate toast. At five in the morning, when the weather was already quite chilly, they left us in good spirits. Our negroes were often invited to these gatherings, but my negress never went. When all of our crops had been harvested and garnered, we commenced to work our land and to undertake the labours which precede the winter. Under a shed was piled up the wood which was to be sold. The sleds were repaired and repainted. I bought a large piece of coarse blue and white checked flannel to make two shirts for each of my negroes. A tailor was employed by the day at the farm to make them coats and well-lined caps. This man ate with us, because he was white. He would certainly have refused if we had asked him to eat with the slaves, although they were incomparably better dressed and had better manners than he. But I was very careful not to express the least remark upon this custom. My neighbours acted in this way, and I followed their example, and in our reciprocal relations I was always careful not to make any allusion to the place which I had formerly occupied on the social ladder. 
I was the proprietor of a farm of 250 acres. I lived in the same manner as my neighbours, neither better nor worse. This simplicity and abnegation gave me more respect and consideration than as if I had wished to play the lady. I never lost a moment. Every day, winter and summer alike, I was up at dawn, and my toilette did not take long. The negroes, before going to their work, assisted the negress to milk the cows, of which we had eight. During this time I was busy with skimming the milk in the dairy. The days we made butter, two or three times a week, Mink remained to turn the handle of the churn, a task which was too difficult for a woman. All the rest of the making of the butter, which was quite tiresome, was my task. I had a remarkable collection of bowls, spoons, wooden spatulas, which were the work of my good friends, the Indians, and my dairy was considered the cleanest and also the most elegant in the county. This year the winter came very early. During the first days of November, the black curtain which announced the snow commenced to rise in the west. As we would have wished, there followed eight days of bitter cold, and the river in twenty-four hours was frozen to the depth of three feet before the snow began to fall. When it began to snow, it fell with such violence that you could not see a man at the distance of ten paces. Prudent people took care not to hitch up their sleighs to mark out the routes. This work was left to those who were more in haste, or to those whose business compelled them to go to the city or to the river. Then, before venturing upon the river, we waited until the passageways to descend upon the ice had been marked by pine branches. Without this precaution it would have been very dangerous to venture on the ice, and every year there were accidents caused by imprudence. The tide before Albany, and as far up as the junction of the Mohawk, rises several feet, and the ice often does not remain upon the water. Our winter passed like the preceding one. We frequently went to dine with the Schuylers and the Van Rensselaers, whose friendship never changed. Monsieur de Talleyrand, who was again living at Philadelphia, had been able to recover, in a very singular manner, certain articles which belonged to me. A medallion portrait of the Queen, a casket, and a watch which had been left me by my mother. He knew from me that our banker at The Hague had advised me that he had placed these articles in the hands of a young American diplomat. I have forgotten his name, fortunately for him, with the request that he should arrange to send them to me. But although Monsieur de Talleyrand had done his best, he had never been able to put his hand on this person. Finally, one evening, when calling upon a lady of his acquaintance at Philadelphia, she had spoken to him of a portrait of the Queen, which Monsieur had procured at Paris, and which he had loaned her to show to some of her friends. She wished to know from Monsieur de Talleyrand if the portrait was good. Hardly had he looked at it before he recognised that it belonged to me. He took possession of the medallion and informed the lady that it did not belong to the young diplomat. Then he went at once to find the latter, and without any preamble, demanded from him the casket and the watch which the banker at The Hague had confided to him with the portrait. The young man was much embarrassed, and ended by restoring all of these articles, which Monsieur de Talleyrand sent to us at the farm. End of Part 2, Chapter 4「Chapter 5a of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire」This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1796, Departure for Europe 
Towards the end of the winter of 1795 and 1796, I had the measles and was quite ill. We were afraid that Humbert also would take them, but he did not, although he slept in my room. I soon found myself in good health, and it was at this moment that we received letters from Bonny in France, which informed us that joining his efforts to those of Monsieur de Boucan, he had succeeded in having the sequestration raised at Le Bouil. The property of the persons who had been condemned had been restored. My mother-in-law, in concert with her son-in-law, the Marquis de la Met, acting in the name of his children, again entered into possession of the estates of Tesson and Ombleville, and of the house at Saint, which the department of Charente and Ferrieux had occupied. But when they requested that the seals should be taken off at Le Bouil, the authorities objected on account of the absence of the proprietor. Our family represented that the owner was living in America with a passport, and that neither my husband nor myself, who personally owned a house at Paris, had been inscribed upon the list of emigres. After numerous discussions, they allowed us a delay of a year in which to put in a personal appearance, in default of which Le Bouil will be placed on sale as national property. Our friends therefore urged us to return as soon as possible. Nevertheless, as the stability of the French government inspired even at this time very little confidence, they recommended us at the same time not to take our passage for a French port, but rather to return by way of Spain, with which the Republic had just concluded a peace which seemed likely to be durable. These dispatches fell in the midst of our tranquil occupations like a firebrand which quickly lighted in the hearts of all around me the thought of a return to their native land. As for myself, I had an entirely different feeling. France had left in my mind only a recollection of horror. There I had lost my youth, which had been broken by terrors the remembrance of which I could not forget. I had not then, and I never have had since in my mind but two feelings which entirely and exclusively mastered me, the love of my husband and of my children. Religion, the only motive now for all my actions, commanded me not to oppose the least obstacle to a departure which frightened me and cost me dear. A sort of presentiment caused me to foresee that I was going to encounter a new life of trouble and anxieties. My husband did not dream of the intensity of my regret when I saw the moment of our departure arrive. I imposed only one condition that of giving our slaves their liberty. My husband consented, and reserved for me alone this happiness. These poor people, on seeing the letters arrive from Europe, had feared some change in our life. They were disturbed and alarmed, therefore all four of them were trembling when they entered my room to which I had called them. They found me alone. I said to them with emotion, My friends, we are going to return to Europe. What shall I do with you? The poor creatures were overcome. Judith dropped into a chair in tears, while the three men covered their faces with their hands, and all remained silent. I continued, We have been so satisfied with you that it is just that you should be recompensed. My husband has charged me to tell you that he will give you your liberty. On hearing this word, our good servants were so stupefied that they remained for several seconds without speech. Then all four threw themselves at my feet, crying, Is it possible? Do you mean that we are free? I replied, Yes, upon my honour. From this moment, as free as I am myself. Who can describe the poignant emotion of such a moment? Never in my life had I experienced anything so sweet. Those whom I had just promised their liberty surrounded me in tears. They kissed my hands, my feet, my dress, 
and then suddenly their joy ceased and they said we would prefer to remain slaves all our lives if you would stay here the following day my husband took them to albany before a judge for the ceremony of the manumission an act which had to be public all the negroes of the city were present the justice of the peace who was at the same time the steward of mr van rensselaer was in very bad humour he attempted to assert that prime being fifty years of age could not under the terms of the law be given his liberty unless he was assured a pension of a hundred dollars but prime had foreseen this case and he produced his certificate of baptism which attested that he was only forty-nine they made the slaves kneel before my husband and he placed his hand upon the head of each to sanction his liberation exactly in the manner of ancient rome we let our dwelling with the land which surrounded it to the same individual from whom we had purchased it and we sold the greater part of our equipment the horses brought a quite high price i distributed by way of souvenirs several little articles in porcelain which i had brought from europe as for my poor judith i left her some old silk dresses which have without doubt been handed down to her descendants towards the middle of april seventeen ninety six we embarked from albany to descend to new york after having paid tender and thankful adieu to all those who for two years had overwhelmed us with tender thoughts friendship and kindness of every kind how many times two years later when enduring another exile have i not regretted my farm and my good neighbours at new york we stayed with mr and mrs olive who received us in their pretty little country house here we found monsieur de talleyrand who had decided like us to return to europe madame de stael was back at paris where she was living with benjamin constant she urged him to return and enter the service of the directory which demanded the aid of his ability for a moment he had thought that he would take his passage upon the same vessel with us but when he learned our intention to land at a spanish port whence we expected to gain bordeaux he changed his plans and resolved to take passage on a vessel bound for hamburg there was no ship leaving for Coruña or for Bilbao in the north of Spain, as we would have wished. Only one boat, a superb English vessel of 400 tons, was going to Cadiz at an early date. For lack of anything better, and in spite of the long journey which we would have to make in Spain, we decided to engage our passage on this vessel. It sailed under the Spanish flag, although it as well as the cargo belonged to an englishman the proprietor who was named mr enstall was to go as a passenger he was an old shipowner who had been interested in whaling he did not know a word of french the captain who was originally from jamaica also spoke only english but he soon found a very intelligent interpreter in my son who although only six years of age was of great use to him while occupying our time with our outfit and our arrangements for the voyage we passed the three remaining weeks with mrs olive in company with monsieur de talleyrand in the harbour there was a french sloop of war commanded by captain barret his father my husband had known in the household of the old duc d'orleans the father of philippe egalite although a regular sea-dog he was a very pleasant man he came for us every day in his boat and conducted us to every part of the harbour taking good care never to approach sandy hook where captain later admiral cochrane had waited for two months to capture him if he attempted to come out we visited his sloop which was armed with fifteen guns it was a jewel of order neatness and care how i should have loved to have returned to europe in this fine boat but the maria josepha awaited us we went on board my husband myself our young son Humbert, and monsieur de chambeau the sixth of may seventeen ninety six and the same day we set sail 
there were several other passengers on board among them was a monsieur de Labour, an emigre a former officer of the constitutional guard of louis the sixteenth who had escaped from a thousand dangers at the time of the massacres of the tenth of august as he was from bordeaux a kind of attachment was formed between him and my husband then there was a french merchant monsieur tisserandeau and his wife he had been unfortunate in business at new york and was going to make another attempt at madrid his wife was young sweet quite well brought up but lazy the persons whom i have just named with mr ensdell and the captain made up the table in the large salon i did not suffer from seasickness and the weather being superb i was occupied all day long as soon as i finished the work which i had brought for my husband and myself i then set up for a general seamstress and announced that any one could give me work to do every one brought me something i had shirts to make cravats to hem and linen to mark the voyage lasted forty days because the captain against the advice of mr ensdell had taken a southerly course and had been carried away by the currents this time was sufficient for me to put the wardrobe of everybody on the boat in order finally about the tenth of june we saw cape st vincent and the next day we entered the harbour of cadiz the captain by his stupidity and ignorance had prolonged our voyage by at least fifteen days by allowing himself to be carried towards the coast of africa whence he had a great deal of trouble in returning to the north he believed that he was so far from land that he had not even thought of sending a sailor as a lookout to the top of the mast when he discovered at daybreak cape st vincent which is very high he was entirely disconcerted we were moored alongside a french vessel with three decks the jupiter it was there with a french fleet which had been prevented from going out by the english men of war superior in number which were cruising every day almost in sight of the port we were visited at once by the boat of the health officer who notified us that we would be kept a week on board in quarantine we preferred this to being sent to the lazarette where we would have been devoured by all the numerous insects which are so abundant in spain if we had been able to find a boat which was going to bilbao or barcelona we should have taken passage the voyage thus would have been shorter less tiresome and less expensive the name of monsieur de chambeau had not been erased from the list of emigres and he was not able to return to france he wished to go to madrid where he knew several persons but nevertheless he would have willingly accompanied us as far as barcelona which would have brought him quite near to Arche, a city in which he owned some property the uncertainty of our plans formed the subject of our conversation during the quarantine which lasted ten days and which might have been prolonged even more on account of the desertion of one of our sailors this man of french nationality had been captured in a combat upon a sloop of war he recognized a sailor on board the jupiter which was moored alongside us and spoke to him through a megaphone that same night he swam to the jupiter and when the health officer proceeded to call the roll the following morning no trace of him could be found except his shirt and trousers this was his whole wardrobe this incident prolonged our quarantine until the day that it was ascertained that the fugitive was on the french vessel the quarantine was nearly fatal to me every day sellers of fruit came alongside the boat and i passed my time with madame tisserandeau in lowering a basket by means of a cord in order to obtain figs oranges and strawberries eating this fruit made me very ill finally permission was received to give us our liberty the captain put us on land and never in my life have i been so much embarrassed as at this moment on landing they ordered madame tisserandeau and myself to enter a little room looking out on the street while they examined our effects with the most exaggerated minuteness 
our coloured dresses and our straw hats soon attracted a large crowd of individuals of every age and of every condition sailors and monks porters and gentlemen all anxious to see what they doubtless considered to be two curious animals as for our husbands they had been detained in the room where our baggage was examined we were therefore alone with my son this indiscreet curiosity decided us my companion and myself immediately to dress like the spanish women even before proceeding to the inn we went to purchase black skirts and mantillas so as to be able to go out without scandalising the whole population we stopped at the hotel which was reputed to be the best at cadiz but which was so dirty as to cause me the greatest discomfort accustomed as i was to the exquisite neatness of america and i would willingly have returned on board our boat i happen to remember that one of the sisters of poor Theobald Dillon, massacred at Lille in 1792, had married an English merchant established at Cadiz by the name of Langton. Having written him a polite note, he came at once and was very attentive to us. At that time his wife, with his younger daughter, was at Madrid visiting a married daughter, the Baron d'Andia nevertheless mr langton invited us to dinner and even wished to have us stay at his house but we did not accept as i was too ill to take the trouble to be polite it was arranged that the dinner should be put off until the first day that i felt better the day after our arrival my husband took our passport to be visaed by the french consul-general he was a monsieur de Roxante a former comte or marquis now changed into a hot republican if not a terrorist he asked my husband a hundred questions and made a note of his replies all this was very much like an examination then he suddenly exclaimed citizen we have received today excellent news from france that rascal charette has finally been taken and shot so much the worse replied monsieur de la tour du pin he was at least a worthy man the consul then kept silent and signed the passport which he reminded my husband it would be necessary to present again to the french ambassador at madrid later we learned the manner in which he had recommended us at bayonne end of part two chapter five a